I know folks are very interested in listening to Tom and Tom and have them hear their insights. Um, I'll quickly introduce people. Uh, as, as an analyst myself, I have to remind myself I have two ears and one mouth. This has been a great week to listen and learn, and especially with, with experts like Tom Redman and Tom Davenport. So um, I think in both cases, I'm not sure they need an introduction, but Tom Redman is uh, also known as the Data Doc, President of Data Quality Solutions. He helps startups and multinational corporations, as well as in senior executives and chief data officers um, handle data quality and analytics. Uh, Tom's next book, People and Data, Uniting to Transform Your Business, is available for pre-order now. Tom Davenport is uh, somewhat of ubiquitous presence in some very important forums. Uh, the Wall Street Journal, Oxford University, Babson, MIT, um, many others as well. He's published several books on data and has, I think, two underway right now. So. What I will do is hand over to Tom and Tom. Uh, I don't think I do, but maybe I had three underway the, a little while ago, oh, but I got did. all those okay. out of the way. Yeah, yeah. Well done, okay. Maybe that was even since Tuesday, my, my information would be dated. Um, so I'm gonna hand over to Tom and Tom, and they're going to dig into the topic today, which is the need for tweener roles in data science. Um, thank you very much, Kevin. Thank you. So, uh, thank you for having us here and, and spending part of your day listening to us on what I think is a pretty important topic and, and, and part of a larger topic. Uh, for me, this, this business of tweeners goes back uh, a, a very long time. I was actually trained as a statistician, and my first job was in, was in Bell Laboratories. And uh, Bell Laboratories is a, sort of the research arm of AT&T, um, you know, which, which you may have heard of. And, um, and, and so as a data scientist, I mean, like, I was brilliant, right? So, you know, I always did good work, right? But, but the cold, brutal reality is only some of it add a, uh, added value to the company, right? And, and as, as far as I can tell, when we were well-connected, we had a chance, right? And being well-connected didn't guarantee success, but not being well-connected guaranteed failure, right? And, and so this business of getting connected um, has been has, has been a big deal and in my mind for for a long time and it's by the way everybody kind of gets what a tweener is right you know between a and b between data science and anything else or so whatever it is and and um, but anyway so most of my time I spent on data quality as as as, uh, as Kevin mentioned and but uh, sort of more recently you know, data science has become increasingly important and and I've just seen this you know this this the same thing that data scientists are experiencing was exactly what I was experiencing. And, and you know, so we'd see these things like data wranglers and engineers and so forth. And, and then, um, and then uh, maybe it was uh, about a year ago, so this concept of a data product, uh, data product manager, and Tom and Malcolm Hawker and others I respect were really pushing that. So I reached out to Tom and I said, you want to try to wrangle this to the ground, right? You know, try to sort it out. And, and he said, yes. And then he said, you know, what will force the issue is if we put in a proposal, right, you know, go somewhere, we'll write something or whatever it is, and, and that will force us to think about it. And, and, and so, um, so our plan today is, is kind of, you know, one of us will talk, and when the other gets sick of listening to that person, he'll, um, you know, oh, Tom, my turn kind of thing. Um, and, and we'll feel free to kib kibitz uh, with, with one another. I think in many respects, this is an unsettled area. We do not have our organizations for data right, and, and, um, and in particular for data science. And, and so we're speculating on this. So we won't always agree on, on, on these things, and I, I don't think we're going to try to hide any of that. But I want to start with our understanding of the problem, right? And, and you know, there are so many things like once you really understand the problem, the solution becomes a lot easier. We'll go through a bunch of things that companies are trying. This is a hard problem. I'm really glad to see some of this organizational experimentation on, on getting things right. Um, frankly, we're both of the opinion that, that uh, companies can do a lot better. And, and we're sort of looking at this by dissecting what are the steps in data science and, and what do they require that you have in place and then build up from there the, the right organizations. Um, you know, like, I, I must confess that I would not want to be a tweener, 
right? Tweeners have hard jobs. They, there's, and so, so we'll look at some of the fact forces in, impacting the rise and fall of those and, and discuss some implications for uh, chief analytics and, and data officers and, and then, you know, sort of what we have to say. So, um, well, so Tom Davenport made this really interesting um, comment uh, it's a, maybe in one of your books recently, or an article where you said progress has been slow and expensive, right? And um, and sort of we built on that. It's slow, expensive, and uncertain. And last night I was in a in a, in a session where we built further on it. It has been slow, expensive, uncertain, and often painful. Okay, and uh, so so it's just like, well, why is this? And 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 so you know, sort of digging deeper. We see two main root causes, and, and the first is, is data science. So what do you do? You go out, you set, establish a data science center of excellence, and you bolt it on to the organization and basically say, good luck, guys, right? Go figure it out, right? And, and it, look, look, I mean, that no longer does. Sooner or later, data science has to be built into the organization, which I mean in the same way that finance is built into the organization or other service parts of a, a, a company are, are built in. And, and, and so, I mean, by the way, I mean, it's like you can't optimize for everything in your organization. And it was perfectly fine 20 years ago to bolt it on. But if you're really serious about using data science and, and, and having data transform your business, we need to get it more mainstream. Um, and so that's the first one. And, and, and then the second one gets down to, to sort of tension. And, and, and look, any two departments, they, um, you know, there's, there's a natural tension between them. They're competing for resources, for people, for senior attention, and so forth. But it runs deeper between data science and line organizations. And if you think about line managers and the tough jobs they have, right, they come in every day and they're working with quotas. And, and they, they got all kinds of things going on, right? It's a tough job, but what do they prize is stability, predictability, control, right? And all kinds of things can knock things out of control, right? So, you know, they may be expecting some stuff and, and the supply chain breaks down and they don't have their stuff. Or the data may be bad, worse than usual kind of thing. They have to spend more time dealing with that. Or people don't show up kind of thing, right? And, and we're three people short, we still got to do the work of 10 people with seven now kind, kind of thing. And so, and so if you're a line manager, I mean, the ability to, to be under control, to prevent disruption, I mean, it's a big deal. And then the data scientist comes along and goes, man, do I have a great idea for you. We can completely disrupt this whole process, right, kind of thing. So, okay, now, usually, the line manager has two words for the data scientist, and they're not Merry Christmas, right? Okay, and, and so, not, so, so, so this is built in, right? And as the way we set up our organizations, um, Roger Hurl and, and Dion Conan and myself have really tried to track this back. And as best we can tell, it's on Edison. Right, Thomas Edison was right. You know, like the first industrial lab, right? You know, kind of thing. Is that he separated the lab from the factory? Now they happened to be on the same property, kind of thing. And Edison went back and forth, forth between them. But it's like we separated these things. And and now with with um, um, you know this this whole thing about disruption is it makes that separation more and more distant. And and um, so you know, like like one symptom of this is that so many. Data science projects never get uh, deployed. We, which there is a lot of survey data suggesting that the percentage is quite small. I don't think anybody really knows how many in a particular organization or even what the right percentage of data science um, projects that should be deployed. But it's probably higher than 13% in one survey, 15%. In another survey, it's a lot of activity going for not much economic value, if if they're really that low. Yeah, and that seems to be the case. And by the way, if the failure rate is you know is is nine and ten, then the ones that succeed better be pretty darn good, right? <laughs> Otherwise, it just it doesn't prove in. Now, 
Now, these, these issues, and so these are deep issues, and over time, these are the issues we have to solve, right? And, and they may be so fundamental that they're, you know, they're really going to demand a, a new management paradigm for, for data science and, and, and data. So, I mean, I, I'm becoming increasingly convinced that that's the case, but, but you know, we'll, we'll, we'll see how that goes. Um, so I think I covered I, I, I covered most of this point. So, but you know, like like line managers and data scientists, and they just don't understand each other. But it's not as simple as you know we need to talk more. There are different objectives, right? Um, and, uh, and and of course, then if you're going to do data science, so what are you doing? I mean, you're pulling in data from lots and lots of disparate sources, right? Uh, a lot of times, the the stuff is not very good in its line use, and, but then it's really, really not fit for use in, in, uh, in data science as everybody complains there's not enough you know, data engineers to kind of deal with all this, this stuff. Um, you know, once you develop a model, then you have to really crank it up, right? And, and, and stuff comes in, you just need to stream it or whatever it is, but uh, you know, a, a telecom term, high bandwidth pipelines. So, you know, we got to get a lot of things through in a, in a lot of fat, uh, in, in a short amount of time. Um, and, um, you know, and so, so that's an engineering job. Um, implementing a, a model, you know, so like the easy part is doing, is developing the model. I think one time we estimated for every dollar you spend, in, you know, developing the model, you need to spend 100 uh, doing the things to, to get it deployed. And, so the process changes, the training, and so forth. And, and then, of course, uh, models must be built into the existing R, uh, IT infrastructure. And it's been like, you know, this term technical debt. Well, everybody knows. It's just sort of growing exponentially and, and, and out of control, right? And, and so we're not going to take up the whole management paradigm thing here, but we are going to try to take up these gaps kind of thing. So, all right. So, um, you know, we sat down last Monday and we sort of said, well, Tom, what slides do you want to take? What slides do you want to take? And, and, um, and we wrote it down on a sheet of paper and I was convinced we'd both forget anyway. So um, at this point, you're supposed to go, Tom, my turn. My turn, Tom. Thank you very much. <laughs> Give me that clicker. Um, so um, as Tom suggested, this is a tale as old as time in the sense that We've always had these gaps between technical people and business people. And various roles have emerged throughout the years to try to close that gap. I think Tom um, Redmond had mentioned that, was it at Bell Labs that they introduced the idea of systems engineers? Analysts, systems engineers to right. try to close that gap. And um, as I understand it, I was a baby at the time, but systems analysts were created many years ago to deal with that issue, and then business analysts. And then when we got, that was more the IT to business gap, but when we got to data science and analytics, you have these um, new roles of data wranglers and data engineers, and I forget um, that I was doing some work with an insurance company, and they called them purple people. That uh, fortunately, that's a name that never really caught on. But uh, you know, the mix of I, I forget what were the red skills and what were the blue skills. But you know, like a purple state, it's a it's a mix. We we don't seem to have too many purple states anymore either. Um, this idea of translators came along, and I think um, a McKinsey article first argued that that was an important role in data science, and a few organizations have implemented it successfully. Um, Ivan Herrero back here from Intercorp in Peru said that they'd had some pretty good luck with that. And DBS Bank had a practice of assigning one translator for every two data scientists on projects, which I thought was quite unusual. Um, and as Tom said, more recently we have this idea of data product managers. I'm quite enthusiastic about this concept because I think um, it, it's not just um, playing this intermediary role, but also ensuring that things get deployed and used over time. And by the way, I should say, this is not just a sort of um, 
uh, institutional issue. It's also, I think, a preference issue on the parts of both sides. Uh, business people don't really want to spend their time with data science nerds, thank you very much. And data scientists, in many cases, not to stereotype too much, don't really care that much about deployment. Um, I found this hard to believe for many years, but I once submitted a, an article. I, I was a column editor, I think, for this journal. It's a new journal called the Harvard Data Science Review. Sounds very prestigious. So I thought, yeah, that'd be a good place to publish. It turns out nobody really reads it, but um, <laughs> uh, it is free. I, there are some good things in there on occasion. But I wanted to write a column on the issue of deployment. And the editor, who's a great guy, he's a, he was a Harvard statistician, really sing, almost single-handedly revitalized um, uh, the statistics concentration at Harvard by actually talking about the statistics of chocolate and dating and wine and so on, just um, really did a good job of, of pulling students in. But he had this curious idea that columns should be peer reviewed. Generally columns, you get to say what you want and you don't have to have them reviewed. So anyway, I wrote this column on deployment as a critical data science resource. And he sent it out to three reviewers and two out of three said that I was nuts, that Deployment was not the job of data scientists. They shouldn't even have to concern themselves with deployment. They should just um, concern themselves with creating better models. Um, you know, my view was that inattention to deployment is attention to unemployment for data scientists, frankly. But um, I, I think it is somewhat built into the personalities of the, the people involved on both sides. So no matter what we do, I think it's Tom's phrase, um, that fun game whack-a-mole, we um, knock out the gap by creating this new role and then it seems to appear someplace else. Um, new intermediaries come along. Um, in data science, some people have argued that tools like um, MLOps are able to close that gap on their own. Um, I'm not sure that's true. I do think that in some cases, I did some research a few years ago on MLOps for um, Data Robot, a company vendor here in Boston, and they, I said, okay, tell me some of your um, customers who are using MLOps, and they gave me a number of people to talk to, and none of them were banks. And I thought, well, that's nutty, because banks really rely more on their models than any other industry. Why, do you, why aren't you giving me any, any banks? And they kind of hemmed and hawed, and finally they said, well, it's because banks have people um, to do this work, you know, uh, people who manage model risk, and um, so they don't really feel the need for um, systems to do it. In general, I think probably people do a better job than systems on their, on their own, but both is a good combination. Um, but um, as more and more companies become digitized, I don't have to sell this idea to you, it's important that we solve this problem and as artificial intelligence gets more popular in companies, I think it, it's um, also even more important to address the issue. Um, so um, companies are trying different things. Uh, um, a number are trying data product managers. Um, I've written a few things uh, about Regions Bank and their, their um, chief data and analytics officer, Manav Misra, done a great job of establishing these data product manager roles and they're assigned um, to the business. Um, Tom, you should talk about uh, the next three because you know much more about that than, than I do. Yep. Oh, we have yes. slides on these, Tom. Oh, oh, on all of these. Oh, yeah. I had it, but we don't have a slide on Regions Bank, I don't think, do we? Um, hmm. Anyway. <laughs> talk about it here. Okay, go for it. Golf Bank is Tom's consulting client. Okay, you want to talk about golf bank? Yes. Okay. Uh, may I have the clicker? So we do have a slide on this. Um, so, so, um, so, so the note. This is a, a, a sort of pattern we've seen in, in data quality. Um, so, you know, data is created in each department in every company, and it's used in each department in every company. And um, and so, you, if if you want to sort of, sort of improve data quality, you've got to get to individual departments and teams and and people and so forth and 
And so, um, you know, companies are big and the data and, and data teams are small. And, and so we've developed this notion of an embedded data manager. And, and so, you know, here we have this small, you know, data science team, but, but then seeding each department with a, with a person in a part-time role who's, who's sort of like, you know, got that tip of the sphere for all things data within that team. And, um, and uh, successfully deployed this at Gulf Bank. When we started on this presentation, that was not yet in the public domain, but it is in the public domain now. And, um, and there, a, a woman named May Alawaish is the chief data officer there. She may be around today if you want to uh, chat with her about it. But, but this has been really, really effective at, at, at sort of in some ways upping the size of the data team and putting it local. Right, and, and I think of these people as tweeners. They're the, between the business department and, and the data science team. Um, generally, I call them ambassadors. At Chevron, they were called responsible parties. Uh, Shell called them embedded data managers. But this has been a, a, a good idea, right? Um, the, um, one other thing that's been very helpful at, uh, at Gulf Bank has been this idea of change management. We talk a lot about that, right? But here, the uh, actually had an HR department that was invested in that, had the expertise, and, and so they are the maroon people on, on, on this graphic, um, right? So, you know, sort of our design criteria is about one person in 40 is, is an embedded data manager and, and in a part-time role, quarter, half-time, or, or whatever. Um, the, um, so, so, sort of this business, and the next one we talk about is is, is this Altria, and um, and so Altria is you know that's the old Philip Morris, right? You know, and, and like so, you know, uh, their their stuff gets sold in in literally tens of thousands of retail outlets, and if they want to make predictions about you know how their products are going to go and do any any sort of performance planning, they've got to be able to integrate that data, and they've got to be able to do it in a in, in a really fast way, and and so, so um, they they use a concept. Of, you may have heard it. You know, some people call it data supply chain management. Um, at AT and T, we developed this concept just called process management, and the steps of process management are outlined there. One of the things that that AT and T did that was really good was step one of everything was clarify management responsibility. Right, and so if you're going to manage a complicated supply chain, who specifically throughout that chain is going to be is is going to join join that effort? Okay, and as a consultant, I mean this overall process, this this notion of supply chain management, um, is is has just proven to be a wonderful uh, s sort of organizing principle for for how to do this. A uh, Tom and a guy named Theus. Uh, Theos Injano, Injano, and how do you pronounce his name? I have no idea. Yeah, uh, <laughs> Theos, right? Uh, wrote this up um, yeah, a, a couple of years ago. And right. The one I think one thing that appeals to me about the data supply chain concept is that um, the early stages of the supply chain have typically been run by IT departments, and they involve. Um, gathering data, collecting data, storing data, et cetera. Um, the latter stages really, I think, require people who are concerned with usage-related issues. And those have been, I think, neglected for many, many years. And so one of the good things about the tweener idea is that they tend, because they're working with business people, they tend to push an organization more toward thinking about the consumption and use stages of the data supply chain. Yeah, that's exactly right. I mean, right after step one of get the management responsibilities in place is understand the customer and their needs, right? And, and then part of that step is, you know, as you work your way back into the supply chain, making sure that everyone in that chain understands, here's what we're trying to do, here's the customers, right? Here's the overall needs. Let's break those down into what what you need to do. Um, okay. So again, I mean, this has just been unmatched in in, in complicated supply chains from a you know a, a data quality perspective. Um, this slide this, this slide is on the data science bridge, and, and one of the things I did not know when I was at Bell Labs, but 
but I learned later was that um, AT&T was fully aware of the, 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 the sort of tension between line managers and, and, and lab people and disruptors. And, and, um, and, and so they built this thing called the, the technology transfer process. Right? So it's a managed, right, from, managed from research to what was called forward-looking work departments, to people who wrote specifications for products, to people who worked in the factory to ensure those specifications were built into processes, and then on then after odds, after deployment kind of thing. That make sure there was that feedback loop for the, for the next generation. Now notice I said, right, into things that went into products, right? So colleagues of mine, right, who, who were working on things that got built into products, those connections were already made, right? Those connections were already made. And, and, um, and so I was, you know, mostly working on in the parts of the business where those connections were, were, were not made, right? And, and so this notion of that process, how are we going to do this and do it over and over and over again at, at scale, I mean, it is a big deal, right? The, the, um, this notion of the data science bridge is the equivalent of that technology transfer process that, that was so effective in, in AT&T. And it has things like drive collaboration, right? Right, right there in, in the middle of it. Develop the human capital. It's, I mean, you know, Tom talked about this as, you know, people are on both sides of this. People on both sides have to, have to learn new skills and, and so forth. So, so this is a relatively new idea. Uh, the fellow I mentioned before, Diego, works uh, with, with the Swiss government, the statistical agents and statistical agencies in the Swiss government. And so about two years in, he is really beginning to gain traction with, with this idea. Okay? And they've even published a guide to all of this for how data science is going to be managed within the Swiss government, right? Which, yeah, that's exactly right. Which we do not have in the United States of America, for better or worse. Yeah, it's, you know, like there's this person named, or it's, I mean, like the title is not this, but essentially the head of the data science bridge uh, responsible for these, you know, these enterprise level, enterprise level functions. Um, okay, Tom, I think. Yeah, so um, as I mentioned, um, the MLOps idea was intended to address some of these issues as well, and lots of vendors offer it now. Um, almost all the cloud vendors have it, as well as some specialized ones. Um, and it started with the idea that once we deploy, we need to watch out for drift, you know, because the world changes and our models don't, and we find out that maybe they're not predicting so well anymore. But then people decided in the vendor community, and I think it, it's a true um, observation that really helpful if you use this to manage all aspects of the data science process and you know, maybe not some of the heavily human ones that, that Tom mentioned early on, but um, once you start into um, development and deployment, keep track of who's doing what, and if you're an organization uh, like some banks, for example, have thousands of models in deployment and a number in development as well. So you need something to keep track of all of this. And if you believe that machine learning models are an important business asset and you're running your business on the basis of them, pretty important to, to know exactly what you have. But as I suggested, I think it also requires an organizational capability. And in the case of some organizations like banks, maybe even competes with it. You can say, well, I can have people do this or I can have systems do it and I'm not sure um, which, to, which to use. Um, so this is fundamentally, I think, an organizational structure question. If you believe that um, intermediaries or tweeners are, are necessary, you have a lot of questions to address about where do they sit in your organization? Are they IT people? Are they on the business side? Are they in some data science center of excellence? Um, do they report to one part of the organization or to a matrix, um, uh, a dotted line and a solid line? 
Um, do we need more than one type? Do we need a data product manager and a um, business analyst and a, and a um, translator? How do we attract these people? What kinds of backgrounds do they have? How do we um, know whether they're doing their jobs well or not? How do we, how do we compensate them? Um, I think in most organizations, it's probably fair to say, I don't know why this is, but we, we humans tend to value things that we don't understand very well in many cases. So in, um, <laughs> in universities, I call this physics envy, um, where we um, really think that the physicists who um, hardly anybody can understand what they do, um, we, they have the most prestige and it goes down um, from there generally. Uh, the people who do human-oriented things, um, in um, business schools, for example, organizational behavior is uh, one of the lowest status roles because it involves humans. I mean, how complex could that be? Um, uh, you do hear, um, people said this all the time, I don't, I don't know if you ever heard this, Diana, um, at Harvard Business School, they, you know, they always have reunions. You have to bring people back, um, have fun, give you money, et cetera. <laughs> and um, uh, the complaint is often heard, gee, I wish I'd paid more attention in my organizational behavior class because all my problems are human problems. Um, and um, I, I, th I mentioned this the other day, I think when I was talking um, about uh, how to create value as a CDO, um, Randy Bean does this survey every year of um, uh, data leaders, and one question he always asks is, what um, uh, are your problems in achieving your data objectives based on technology or human-related issues, um, organizational change, culture, behavior change, et cetera, et cetera. And this past year, and almost every year, it's between 80 and 90 percent human and organizational kinds of issues. So um, the problem is I think tweeners will not be valued as much as data scientists are because it's pretty apparent um, what their value is. We're not mystified by it, so therefore we must pay them less anyway. Um, that's an interesting complication in all of this. Um, I, th I think it's a big deal too because yeah. it's, it's not only do they not you know get the respect they need in the data science community, but they also don't get the respect they need in the business community, right? And it is hard to see a career track, right, for 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 tweeners. Um, I mean, um, and there are various external forces that are sort of changing this equation. Um, one could argue that the idea of citizen development is a way of getting around this problem by saying, okay, we're not going to um, have this gap anymore between business people and data scientists, say, because we're going to um, empower them to do citizen data science. Um, now, I think um, citizen data science is eminently feasible. Some organizations, I think on a previous slide, um, I didn't really describe it, but some, um, uh, Todd James was here earlier from 84.51 and the data science subsidiary of Kroger, and they've done a great job, I think, by empowering some citizen data science. In general, I think it's caught on slowly, but if it does catch on, I think it may reduce the need for this um, tweener function and uh, various low-code, no-code tools, it's getting, e it, it's always, as long as I've been in this field, it's gotten easier and easier for non-technical people to do fairly sophisticated analytical work. Um, generative AI, I think, is going to take that to the next level. Anybody played around with code interpreter um, over the last few weeks? Um, uh, what do you think? Is it going to solve this problem on its own? <laughs> No, um, I still find it a little bit um, incomplete and, and um, complex, but basically all you have to do with Code Interpreter, is a, uh, only released in the last couple of weeks from OpenAI, is to say what you want from a data set and voila, um, you get some sort of analysis. I think it's actually better at visual displays of information than it is at doing complex analytics. But I had some of my students playing around with that and a um, citizen data science automated machine learning tool to kind of compare them. But clearly generative AI is going to play a role here and more technically literate business people, which I think we're 
getting more and more of all the time will also solve this problem. Um, however, um, Tom Redman often points out we're, we're, we've never really solved and nor made a whole lot of progress in solving the data quality problem, so that sort of increases the need. Um, Agile methods, I think, dictate a lot of interaction between um, the business side and the technical side, and we may need tweeners to facilitate that. Certainly the poor deployment rate that we discussed earlier increases the need, and outsourcing IT creates even another level of distance between some technical people and some business people. Not only do they not understand what I do, they don't even work for my company. So. Um, uh, who knows exactly within a particular organization what kinds of uh, changes um, we'll observe. Are you, are you this one? I yeah, I'll take, I'll take this one. So, so, uh, so, the, so what should we do, right? And, you and, should you know, take like, the clicker is what you should do right uh, now. <laughs> I took the clicker. Um, it's like every other clicker. Well. Anyway, so, so thinking about this is, okay, well, you know, what do we suggest you do differently now, kind of thing, right? It's, I mean, it, it's going to take a lot of experimentation to, to sort of work this out. And as Tom notes, it's going to be different in different organizations. But, but um, so one of the things that we did is, is we prepared this, is, is we busted open the data science process in great detail. And, and look, it's, you know, different organizations use different versions of this, but at the start, there's always this, you know, figure out the problem, understand the context of, in, in which you're working. And the second step is, is, you know, get the data, prepare it, make it so that you can, you can do something with it, develop the model, right? You know, figure out how to build the model into the process, train people up. Um, deploy the model into into infrastructure. You know, monitor, keep it keep it in place. Well, so look, I mean, there's not a whole lot of mystery in this. Some you know, some organizations use eight steps or six or or whatever it is. But you can work step by step, and say, okay, how what what are the connections I need here? What are the tweener people that I need here? What are the intermediaries I need? Um, my belief is a lot of data science projects fail because they don't get that right, right? They do not, I've seen a lot of head shake up and, up, up and down. Um, this for me was a big observation, you know, it's when I started on this business of, you know, we have to put regular people, right, front and center in our organization for data. And it's because you simply cannot do a data science project well unless you understand the problem and unless you understand the context, and you don't own those either of those things, if you're a data scientist, you must get out there. And and so you know, it's, it's like you know, uh, spend some time thinking through. Well, how are we going to do that? What are the people we need to talk to? What are the intermediaries that uh, that we're going to need to make it so that we can do that? And if we ever do get to the point where just speaking, you know, in uh, conversational language to a generative AI system can create a model, it's not going to solve that first part. Right. Um, a lot of these other parts could well be more automated in the future, but that one I think is still quintessentially human. Yeah, yeah, thank you for that, Tom. I mean, that is, that, that is a good point, right? So I, I think, you know, even the most optimistic sort of, you know, so, so, sort of technological, uh, for futurists, do not think that uh, we're, we're, we're going to see much progress there. The second is prepare the data. And, and, I, and I know this is going to sound, you know, painfully old school, right? But when I joined Bell Labs, the first step was always go see where the data was created. Go talk to the people who did it. Look at the machine that did it. Ask questions like, when was the last time that machine got calibrated? Right, so, you know, do you trust this stuff? How do you use it? Right, is it going to be fit for use in in the uh, in the in in the way I want to use it? Kind of thing, and and then of course you're going to have to do a lot of work. By the way, one of the sort of sub pieces of advice was, if you ask for the last time the machine was calibrated, and the answer is what is that? <laughs> right, you 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 know you're in trouble. Um, you know, I, I personally don't think enough data scientists go out and, and do this, right? Do not spend time 
really understanding all the nuance asso associated with data. And there's a lot of talk of it that, well, better metadata will help solve that problem. I'm not optimistic there. And I see enough head shaking that I'm like, I'm not you know, just out of it on that. But anyway, I mean, this pattern of things. All right, so now if you're going to go out there, well, who's going to introduce you to the people? How are you going to find out what they're, how are you going to make those connections so that they'll actually talk to you kind of thing? I mean, so that's what this intermediary stuff is about. And, and, and in effect, all we're saying is, is, is by busting this out and busting it out in detail, then you can ask yourself, well, who do we need to connect to and what are the intermediaries that are going to get us there kind of thing. And before you start every project, you, you ought to be, you know, doing that work for the particular project. Um, you want to comment on it? I think you've done a good job. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, okay. So, so, I mean, here it is, right, in, some, you know, in, a, in a different way. Write down these steps, right? Define these steps in, in, in some detail. Right, and then outside, it's a, who outside the data team, the data science team must contribute for this project to succeed, right? Identify those who are involved, and then you know the connections that, that, that you need to make. Uh, there, there's not a whole lot of mystery in that. Um, it also sort of you know like one of the pieces of advice. I mean, again, I'm going back to Bell Labs, but like on the second day I was there. Right, the second day I was there, it's, you know, it's like some senior executives of Tom, we're really glad you're here. Here's how you fit in. And, and, um, and then he it was a he at the time, right? And he said, Tom, there's two things you need to do, right? You need to develop your expertise and you need to build your network, right? Because we're not going to be able to make all these connections for you. You're going to have to make a lot of them on, on your own. And, and um, so, you know, if you think data science is about sort of sitting there at your computer and hacking away and, and, and so forth then, um, well, then you're running against the advice of senior Bell Labs executives. Um, all right, so, okay, you know, so then, you know, once you've sort of identified this need, then not a lot of mystery, again, clarify the roles for tweeners and, and put them in place and, and different projects and different programs, as we're speculating, are gonna require different things and some of it may re, you know really require over the long term we have to build this bridge right so we have to build this on a on a program level on a company level um, that's some of it you know it's a lower level so hey we need these data product managers um, I was skeptical about data product managers uh, you know when I first first heard the idea but I think it's beginning to work and um, so so there's a lot there the purple people translators, data supply chain managers, uh, whatever it may be. And I think the other thing to point out in that, um, on that issue is you don't only have to kind of create the role, you have to create a career path for these people, okay. and that's much more complex. Um, I was talking, some of you may have met Sebastian, or as he goes by Basti Clapdoor, um, who is the Chief um, Data and now Technology Officer of Vista, the company that printed many of your business cards, and the CDOIQ um, carry bag. Um, he said next year he hopes for a higher quality carry bag than the one that we got. But <laughs> um, uh, he um, said that. Can, can we trade this year's in and get maybe, two next year? Yeah. Uh, he said that, you know, they had. Um, done quite well with creating a data product management function and uh, appointing data product managers. But at Vista, they have a whole product management function, broadly speaking. And what he's decided to do is slowly move the data product managers into the product management function so that managing a data product is no different than managing a new business card printing function. And they've, in fact, already done it for the externally oriented data product managers, the ones who produce data products for external customers. And eventually, he expects they'll do it for the ones who do things for internal customers. So I mean, product managers have always had a challenging career path because they're sort of ministers without portfolio. They don't have a lot of people working for them, even though they play a very important role. But um, combining them with other product managers or other people who play some intermediate intermediation roles like this might be helpful. 
So thanks for that, Tom. Look, I, I, I think we're going to do something that is, you know, completely, uh, completely un unallowed, which was we're going to end early, right? You know, kind of thing. We'll leave some time for questions. <laughs> From my perspective, you know, the main conclusions are this. The current state in almost every organization today is you need tweeners, right? You, you, you need tweeners, and, and you, know, you may need a lot of them. It's a very difficult role, and, and sort of making it work is, is really, really hard work. Um, but on a project level, you're, today, you're just not going to get by without them. Tom's mentioned, I mean, these issues, which I'm mean, tweeners, it's, it's where do they fit? How do we manage them, right? You know, it says, well, they don't really report into the business. They don't really report into data science. With embedded data managers, we've solved that problem by leaving them in the business. There is no ambiguity about, about that with in, embedded data managers. Um, dramatic technical change may reduce the need for them. Geez, I mean, I can also see it increases the need. If things become really, really powerful and way, way more complex and, um, and, and, and need better alignment. Um, you know, formal education and certification on, on, on these roles, it's, you know, at a certain point, you know, that's going to come. I think the main point for me and, and, and the main learning as is, is I did this work is, is um, you know right now the, the the cold brutal reality is our organizations are unfit for data and in particular they're unfit for data science right and we have some clues for what better organizations are going to look like right but we're going to have to do a lot of experimentation and I've heard a lot of talk to you know about experimenting with Gen AI right I'd also encourage people to experiment with their organizations I mean that's really harder. And you know, in some sense, riskier, but but sort of like you know, we're just continue to bolt this stuff on. It's going to be really, really difficult, right? So you know, I encourage you to have the courage to to try different things, even if you you know are, are you don't know why they work, but take those things that work and do more of them, right? Um, so Tom, you have any final remarks, or should we open up for questions? Let's hear it. What do you think? <laughs> Hold on. Please use the microphone. Online. All questions Here. must be authorized. <laughs> Have you given so very much? Anthony's the tweener here. Yeah, really. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Have you given very much thought about the KPIs for the tweeners that are embedded? Where do the KPIs come from? From the business or from the data side? And how do you manage not only their promotion, but their growth? Uh, so, so I think that question is directed at me. I mean, so look, we've had this thing in, in, in data management called stewardship, and, it, and it's been a disaster, right? And, and so, you know, I, I, I really want to put a stake in that. And, and so, so tweeners are, are, excuse me, embedded data managers are firmly in the line, right? And their KPIs are, are associated with, with making line jobs more effective, line departments more effective. Right, and, and, uh, and their contribution to doing that. Um, right, so they're not there to make the enterprise more effective, they're to make the line more effective. But what happens to the data side of that? Because I've been in that situation. Where right. They've been embedded, and they become almost adversaries to whatever the data organization is trying to do. Yeah, I mean, so Therese is raising a good point, and that is sometimes these embeds become. Uh, you know, they, they want to do something different than the data science team, and I, I don't have a full answer for that, but I think if you and the data science team are doing something different than the organization wants to do, right, yeah, you know, you got a problem, um, right? And so listen to the organization first. Um, I mean, I, I think some organizational change needs to happen in many companies where um, they have to, if they're going to be successful in the current economy we live in, the sort of highly digital and data-oriented one, they're going to have to start recognizing these as important aspects of every function. And it, it's got to gain prestige, it's got to gain compensation, and it's got to gain um, uh, acceptance. And then maybe we'll be able to make this happen in the, when people are embedded in the, in the business. I think that's right. I mean, like, you know, progress is slow and painful and expensive and, and you know, make the organizational changes to give it a chance to go faster. So, yes? 
Uh, thank you for the uh, reflections. I like the idea of trainers and also data product managers. But at the same time, uh, from our research, we see that there are many, many different ways to organize data teams and data organizations. And uh, I wonder whether we are focusing too much on roles and too little on uh, good operating models. Um, because I have recently we have been interviewing um, data heads in, and heads of data analytics in European companies. And you see quite different organizational types depending on whether they are in IT, whether they are in business. Um, you have uh, in Europe also this house of data uh, in some organizations. So, um, and depending on the, the overall setup, uh, these tweener roles are in different situations. And I would like to see a little bit your point on that. Do you also have the bigger picture or some patterns actually then for these tweener roles? We uh, try to satisfy you, Christine, by throwing in references to the Swiss government, but apparently that yeah. didn't do the job. I know, I know. <laughs> So, so, I mean, look, I, you, you know, I think in this larger context, and so we worry, you know, we're worried that the management paradigm is right, that the operating model is right, and, and you know, today we picked out a portion of that having to having to deal with the the, the tweeners, um, right? But it, you know, it, it may you know it may turn out that you know this whole idea of bolting data science on is 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 got a short life, and things have to be built into every organization. Quick follow-up, so for uh, data product managers, what I see that uh, actually there is an additional accelerator which is um, agile approaches, obviously, that are become very prominent. And um, there is SAFE, for instance, as a scaled agile framework that also has product owner and product manager roles. Do you see that something, this is something that actually could help us to establish these Trino roles? Try it. Yeah. Try it. it's, we're, we're all finding our way, I think, so it's worth experimenting with. Yeah, yeah. I mean, look, one of the good things about product managers, there are product managers out there, right? Now, now I worry about how are you going to attract a really good product manager to come into data, right, kind, kind of thing. But, um, you know, that's, that, it's established. There's things people do, right? They bring professional management to an area that is not professionally managed. That is a good thing. And it's not, I think it's not too far away from the idea of software product management, which is reasonably well established. Yeah. Yep. Um, have you um, observed how other um, industries that do a lot of research separate from production, for example, vaccine development or drug development, that, uh, do they have tweeners like this to take a to take an idea or a research project into um, that they've been I suppose established for decades rather than a few a few years is that something that uh, crossed your research so look I mean I, I want to actually expand the question and then say I don't know um, right so 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 it's 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 not just sort of tweeners but a process right a process from moving from the lab right to the factory, to it, right, and and uh, I I think such a process is is you know is essential. But on the other hand, I don't know whether it's true in in drug manufacture. Anthony, was it true in AbbVie? It was. It was. Yep. But you know, but you know, it's interesting. I was talking about this yesterday with a chief scientific officer at a pharmaceutical firm here in Boston, and I was doing some work with, and we were discussing the resignation of the Stanford president um, for having some things appear in his research that he apparently didn't do himself, but he wasn't paying enough attention to. And this person I was discussing it with said, um, it's an old problem and people think that the only way to get respect in scientifically oriented organizations is to continue to run or have involvement in a lab. And the um, president of Stanford tried to do that, and clearly he had some other important jobs, not just running um, Stanford, but before that he ran Genentech and Rockefeller University and so on. And so I think we just have to realize that managing a business is valuable in itself, um, managing a lab is valuable in itself, you know, technical jobs are good, business jobs are good, 
um, we have to sort of have more respect for the people who do the things we can't do very well. Uh, right. And you know, the, he, this guy said yesterday, all the science people think that running a business is child's play, um, but they're wrong. <laughs> yeah. So, and by the way, I mean, we saw that over and over again, right? I mean, you know, like, like running a business is hard work. Getting it in control is hard work, right? Every day is, is, is an adventure. And, you know, and if you, all you've done has been in school and come out, you know, with a fancy degree, it is impossible to have the right level of respect for how difficult that is. So um, have you seen or do you foresee maybe the career path of tweeners going into being those kind of business line operations leaders to try to help move data science from being bolted on to built in and then uh, also help, uh, you know, create that pathway for more technically uh, informed and competent business leaders? So, so what I'd like to see with embedded data managers, and I think this is true in Tweener's comment, but I, I, I'd like to see that you know, the people take an embedded data manager job, a role for two years, and then it goes to somebody else, and then it goes to somebody else, and it goes to somebody else. And, and I, I think that- To it, spread it around in a positive way, you mean? Um, to spread it around in a positive way, you know, to, to build a lot more education, right? To build a lot more sort of, you know, communication in a, in, in a you know, sort of 360 degree manner. And, and so it may be that we really never solve what is the career path for a tweener other than it is you come in and you work in this department for three years and then you have a two-year assignment in a, as a tweener and then you go back to your department right i mean that that may be healthy right but most career tracks in most companies i mean they are very very within a you know within a department kind of thing okay um so so again i mean i i, I mean you know maybe that in a lot of companies there are, it's not like that there's these long-term professional roles called tweener, right? Um, but it's an interim role and, and for, you know, a couple of years. I think it'd be good for everybody. I'm so like data scientists, it's other, you know, you've got to go see the real world. Um, and so it'd be good for them. And, yeah, and in, in general, I think it's eventually going to be everybody's job to do data driven, analytics driven transformation. But in the meantime, we probably need tweeners to make it happen. Some organizations are closer than others. I suspect there are probably people at Amazon, for example, who have progressed through the managerial ranks starting in highly data-oriented roles, but you don't find that in a lot of more you know, traditional companies yet. With that, we are super out of time. Everybody, thank you so much. Tom and Tom, thank you for a wonderful talk. Thank you.